Well, good day, everyone. Uh, it's been a while since being able to preach for you, but it's good to be back, and I yeah appreciate being able to have this opportunity. I'm thankful to be able to share God's word with you tonight. Uh, let's begin with prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time where we can look at your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, that you have made yourself known through your word, and that you have made Christ known in your word, and that you have made the way of salvation known to us, God. We thank you for this. God, we pray that you would work tonight. We need you to work in our lives. We need your spirit to bring conviction. I need you, God, to work through me now, and I need you to bring conviction to me. And we all do, God, and I pray that you would do this now. Be working through your word, and may everything that is said, and may the conviction that you be, bring to us, God, be honoring to you, and may it give you glory. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if any of you have ever tried to burn a lamp that has no oil or kerosene, you would know what happens. The wick starts to burn for a little while, and then eventually it fades and crumbles into ash. But a lamp with fuel will keep on burning and keep on burning, and that wick won't burn up unless that fuel runs out. And this is a picture of our desperate need to rely on God. If we don't rely on God, we are like that wick without fuel that will burn up and crumble into nothing. If we don't rely on God and don't work in His strength, then we will perish for eternity. All our hard work will be in vain. But if we rely on God, we're able to keep going. We are able to keep burning for Him and keep serving Him. I don't want to burn up for God. I don't want to burn away and fade away. And I hope you don't either. And in our passage tonight, as we look at John and continue on through John, we're going to see Jesus teach the disciples their desperate need to rely on him. And we are going to see this for us as well, our desperate need to rely on God. Because if we don't, we will burn out. We will perish. We'll be useless in his service and we'll be unable to do anything effective. So open up to John 21. John 21, verse 1 to 14, that's our passage tonight. John 21, verse 1, I'm going to read it. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Cordidimus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged them ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
So it's quite an unusual story with some odd details throughout it. So what is going on here? What's the big point through this story and all these details? Well, verse 1 shows us, it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and it happened in this way. So this story is about to show us how Jesus appears to his disciples. Jesus is revealing himself here. The word for Jesus being revealed or made known or him appearing is used three times in this passage. But unfortunately, the NIV misses this and only translates it twice as Jesus appearing. And verse 1 then should actually read like this. Have a listen. Listen. Verse 1 should read, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. The central theme of this story is Jesus revealing himself. And so as we read this story, we need to learn about Jesus in it. Verse 14 also shows this. As it concludes the passage that we're looking at, it says, This was now the third time Jesus appeared or revealed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus has already revealed himself twice to the disciples in chapter 20, as we've already seen, and here he reveals himself again. And so the big point here is Jesus revealing himself. But what is he revealing? What is revealed about him? Well, he reveals how he has physically risen from the dead. This story is a clear witness that Jesus is alive in a physical body, Jesus keeps on showing the disciples this, as we, saw, as we have been seeing. And as we go through this story, we will see this now again. But also at the end, we'll close. And we will see some key things that Jesus reveals about himself to equip the disciples for the gospel ministry that is ahead of them. That's the context of this story. It comes just before the disciples are going to be sent out, just before they are going to receive the Holy Spirit and these same things that they need to be equipped for this ministry, for this spreading of the gospel, are things that we need to be equipped for this work too. So let's go through the story. Let's see the detail and all that's going on. Verse 1, as I said, begins and we see Jesus appears to his disciples, and he reveals himself, and it says, in this way, and this is how, it says. And then it goes on to say this in verse 2. It says, Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. Here we have seven of the disciples. First, we have Simon Peter, who seems to be their leader, as we will see very soon. We also have Thomas called Didymus, which means the twin. We have Nathaniel. We have the sons of Zebedee, who are James and John. And we have the two other disciples that are mentioned. And that's probably Andrew and Philip, as they are often mentioned together at points in the gospel. And then verse 3, we see Peter go and lead the group. He says, I'm going out to fish. And then the disciples say to him, we'll go with you. Now, certainly here we see, just stepping away from the story a bit, certainly here we see the impact that example has on others. Peter goes fishing and the others follow like little ducks. And this shows us why we need to live in a way that allows us to be able to say with Paul, as Paul did, that he, to be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. We need to be able to say that because people follow our example. People are watching you. You will be an example to people, whether you like it or not. Your life influences people. What you pursue, what you love, what you cry over, what you speak about is saying things to people. Parents, what are you telling your kids to be important? What are you showing them to be important through how you live? Are you telling them, telling them that money is important, that pursuing a good career Getting a good education or pursuing pleasure is important. Are you saying that through your life? What is your life saying to your kids? What are you wanting and longing for your kids to grow up into? Are you wanting them to have that top education? Are you just wanting them to get a good career, to get a good job, to have a great family? 
Is that what you're wanting for them? Because that's showing what's important to you and that is teaching them so much. We need to watch our lives as parents because we are influencing our kids and showing them what is important in life through how we live, through how we speak. But also for all of us, what are we saying to our friends and to those at work about what is important in life? What are we saying in how we live? We need to be careful of our example because we will influence others, whether we like it or not. But back to the story. What is going on here? Peter says, I'm going fishing. The disciples follow and go with him. Was it right that they did this? Hadn't Jesus told them to be fishers of men? Weren't they to go out and share the gospel? Are they going back to their old way of life here? Well, some take this here to be a sign of their immaturity and that they are are failing to obey Jesus. And some ridicule the disciples here. But is what they do wrong? Is it a running back to their old life in a wrong way? Well, it seems that more is actually going on here and that this incident of them going fishing is actually something that Jesus wanted to happen. Verse 1, it's already said and shown us that all of this takes place at the Sea of Tiberias, which is just another name for the Lake of Galilee. The disciples have left Jerusalem and they've gone to Galilee and Jesus actually told them to do this. In Mark chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus said, After I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And chapter 16 of Mark, verse 7, there the angel says to those at, his, at Jesus' tomb, says, Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Jesus has told the disciples that he would meet them in Galilee. And so it is right that they go there. But what are they to do as they wait? Jesus hasn't yet come and told them what to do. They are still to re- yet to receive the Holy Spirit. They are still to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. So as they are waiting, what are they to do? Well, Peter says in verse 3, I'm going out to fish. And the other disciples said, we'll go with you. And then verse 3 says, So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. It seems it is fair enough that they go to do what they know to do as they are waiting for Jesus and the next step. They are waiting for the Lord. They're waiting for him to lead. And so as they are waiting, they go to do something useful. And as the story unfolds, it seems Jesus wanted this because through it, he reveals himself. And there are some lessons here for us. As you are wondering what God wants you to do, what he wants from you, as you wonder what is next, or maybe as you feel lazy or unsure, of what to do, or even as you feel overburdened with many things to do, what should you do? I know I can have these moments and I can feel paralyzed and unsure of what kingdom work God may want next. What should we do when this happens? What should we do next? Well, we're seeing here, do the next best thing you know to do. Don't waste your life wondering what is next. Get on with something useful and be ready for God to guide and lead in that. As the disciples did the next thing that they could think of, Jesus came and he came and provided for them. He came and guided them and he revealed himself in all of it. And he can do that with us. Well, verse four then goes on in the story to say early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. The disciples are out on the boat fishing. Jesus is on the shore. They see him, but they don't know it's him. Why didn't they know it was him? Well, it may be because it's early morning. It would have been hard to see. Or it could be that there is something different about his resurrected body. And so they don't recognize him straight away. We see this again and again with some of the resurrection appearances of Jesus and the stories that come up in the Gospels. Jesus wasn't always recognized straight away. And it's because his resurrection body was different in some way. He has a body now that is fit for eternity. And so sometimes people didn't recognize him straight away. But back to the story we see in verse 5, Jesus calls them and he says, 
friends, haven't you any fish? And they answer saying, no. In the original, uh, Jesus is actually asking here a question that is implying a negative answer. And it's, it's showing he expects a negative answer. The original text really shows this. And he knows and has planned this event and he's going to teach them something. That's why he's asking this question. He, he knows the answer, but he's planned something. He's going to teach them. And we can really see it in how he asks this question. But also the word friend here, it actually literally means something similar to children or lads or guys. That's what he's saying. And this is again pointing to him and how he's going to teach them something. He's putting them below him and how he's going to be a teacher to them. And then in verse 6, he tells them to do this. He says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some fish. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. For some reason, the disciples, they didn't know it was Jesus, but for some reason, they still listen. And they throw in the net. All night, they had been laboring hard. They had got nothing. And then in one moment, they get a catch that fills the net. And they can't even pull it into the boat. It's interesting Through the Gospels, we see again and again how Jesus is the one who allows the disciples to catch fish. It's it's amazing. They don't, the disciples don't in the Gospels catch fish without the help of Jesus. It seems through all of this that he wants to teach them something. He wants to teach them that they can do nothing without him. Even with something that they knew so well, many of them were fishermen and they did it every day of their lives. They know how to fish and they were doing it all night here in the story and yet they catch nothing. Jesus wants to show them they are dependent on him. And when they only work hard in their own strength, not in the the strength that God can provide, they can do nothing. Jesus wants to teach us this lesson too and we need to learn it and we're going to come back to it at the end and flesh it out a bit more. But after this enormous catch, we then see everything start to click for the disciples. Verse 7 says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. What Jesus has just done in the story showed John, who is the disciple that Jesus loved, uh, we keep seeing that through John. He, this, what Jesus has just done, it showed to John that this was Jesus. And it's probably because Jesus had done similar things, similar miracles to this catching of the fish uh, in places like Luke chapter 5. And so when he says this to Peter, that it is the Lord, Peter jumps out, he gets on his outer garment, puts it around his waist, and then he jumps out. And that's because he'd had the outer garment off while he was fishing. We see here two different responses to Jesus. John, he's discerning. He quickly recognizes what is going on. But Peter, he just acts quickly and he goes to see his Lord. We, we see two different characters here, quite different. And it's important that we notice this difference in these believers, in the disciples. It's important that we realize this about ourselves too, how we are all different. We have a variety of gifts and qualities and characteristics. And so we shouldn't be proud. We shouldn't be proud. We don't have it all. We need to learn from one another. We need each other. No one person has everything. And the Christian life can't have someone who is a lone ranger. The work of spreading God's kingdom requires a body of Christians to work together. And we need to not forget this. There are differences in each other. And this is good. Well, Peter goes in the story to see Jesus and the other disciples are left in the boat to bring in the catch and the boat. And verse 8 says this, The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a 100 yards. That's close to 90 metres. It is interesting here that the story follows those who are in the boat. It doesn't follow Peter and his interactions with Jesus straight away as he swims to the shore. 
It follows the people in the boat. And this shows us some important details. This here shows us how this is an eyewitness account and that the story is following that account. If it was made up here, this story probably would follow Peter and his interactions with Jesus and that would be the focal point of the story. But that's not where the story goes. It sticks with the disciples on the boat here in verse 8. And this is showing the eyewitness account, the nature of it being an eyewitness account. And there's also been a lot of odd details throughout the story that have been showing this to be written by an eyewitness. We've already seen the, the distance given for the, for the boat to the shore. That's been stated already. We've seen the names of the disciples listed. We have seen the fact that Peter didn't have his outer garment on and had to put that on. That's been said. And as well, we see, we're about to see the number of fish here is told in the story. These are quite odd details. They seem to have no place sometimes. Why are they included? What's the point? Well, it's just showing how this is written by an eyewitness and they're showing us things about this author. These details have been put here and they've been put here by God for a reason and to show us how this is written by an eyewitness. As John Bloom says, he says this, God doesn't waste words. Every little detail, even the odd ones here, are important. And so we need to not brush over the random details in the Bible as we read it. They're important. They've been put there by God. So slow down as you read God's Word. And ask this this question as you read, and maybe as you notice something unusual, ask, why did God put this here? Why is it here? But then in the story, we get to verse 9, and we see... The disciples bring in the boat and it says, verse 9, When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. What a pleasant surprise this would have been for them. After working hard all night, here is some breakfast for them. They would have been hungry and here it has been prepared for them. Jesus here has prepared this and this here reveals his humanity and the physical nature of his resurrection as he prepares a meal for them and as he serves them. Jesus prepares this barbecue breakfast for them over the fire and this is the nature of Jesus. This is the nature of the risen Lord Jesus. He is still caring. He is a servant still And he's continuing to be close to them and intimate. He's not detached. He's not distant. But he sits down with them. He prepares brekkie for them. And he has brekkie with his disciples. This is the nature of Jesus. And we see as well here, Jesus serving the disciples. We've been seeing this again and again in the gospel. Jesus served the disciples when he washed their feet. He served us and the disciples by coming to die to give his life as a ransom. Again and again, we see that Jesus came to serve and he serves here by meeting their needs and even just giving them physical strength through the food that they need. But in this, in his service here, in the serving that he's doing and in his caring, we also see that he doesn't ignore the work that he wants the disciples to do. Yes, Jesus can do everything, But he doesn't ignore their work and he wants something from them. Verse 10 says this. Jesus says, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Jesus here, he provides, but he works through the disciples too. And he wants them to work. Jesus didn't just bring about the catch and then get all the fish onto the boat or bring all the fish to the shore. No, he makes the disciples work. They have to bring the fish to the shore and drag it in. And that this is what it is always like with God. He does his work and he wants us to do ours and he works through our work and he enables that work. This is a picture of what it is like as we serve God. He's the one who does the work of spreading his kingdom. He wants our efforts though too. And he wants us to work hard at spreading his kingdom. And he uses those efforts. Yes, we have to rely on God's strength and we can do nothing without him, but we also are to work hard. And this really is what Paul says, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, he says, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. 
Well, verse 11 then goes on to say, Simon Peter climbed aboard after Jesus has just said, go get some fish. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Now, heaps of people here try to read into this number symbolically and say it's a symbol of something and this and that, but there's no need to do this. John gives no indication in the passage that we should do this. They probably would have counted the fish, maybe because they were going to sell fish, the fish in the markets and they would do that before they sell it, or maybe they were counting the fish because they were shocked at the number that had been caught in this net. They probably counted it for this reason and then this detail is included here because we see John is an eyewitness recording this. But what we do see here is something John wants us to notice and that is that the net doesn't break. Jesus has brought about an enormous catch and it seems here that he is making sure that the net doesn't break. He seems to be doing a miracle here. Jesus has done a miracle bringing about an enormous catch and now ensuring the net doesn't break. And then verse, 14, verse 12 to 14 says this. It concludes the passage and says, Jesus said to them, said to the disciples, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. It nearly seems in the passage like it's, that it's like some of the disciples wanted to ask, are, are you really Jesus? But they don't. None of them do because they know it is Jesus and they dare not ask. But also here we're seeing Jesus clearly reveals himself and that's why they are not asking. He's shown the physical nature of his resurrection, how he is truly alive with a body. And as he breaks the bread and the fish and has prepared this meal for them, he is showing the nature of his body and how he has resurrected. Jesus doesn't have to say to them, look, I have a physical resurrected body. No, he just wonderfully shows it through how he provides for them, through how he works in this story. He teaches them this lesson through such an ordinary story, by providing breakfast for them and sitting down with them. And he can be doing this in our life too, teaching us through ordinary circumstances so many things. He does this in our life too. Well, this is the story here. But we need to ask, what what is this story all about? What is its purpose? Well, as we said at the beginning, verse 1, verse 14, both show it is to reveal Jesus And we've already seen throughout how the story reveals the physical nature of Jesus' resurrection, that he has risen and has a body. But more is being shown here. As I said earlier, we know that it it won't be long before the disciples are going to go out. Jesus is about to leave his disciples. It's not long. And he has left them with the call to be fishers of men and to take the gospel out. And they are about to receive the Holy Spirit to do this. And so it would make sense that Jesus wants to prepare them and equip them for this work and strengthen them for the gospel ministry that is ahead of them. We see him doing this in the rest of the chapter as well, preparing them for what is ahead. And he's doing it here at the beginning of the chapter too. He wants to give them some help to be his witnesses, and so he reveals what he is like and some lessons for for them through this story. And they should equip us too for serving God and for taking the gospel out. So what are these lessons? Well, I have three of them. The first one we see here is that Jesus controls all, and so we can do nothing without him. That's the first key lesson in the story. Jesus controls everything, and so we can do nothing without him. In the story, it seems that Jesus wanted the disciples to learn that without him, they can do nothing. And the Christian and the non-Christian needs to learn this. We need to learn that we can do nothing without Christ. Nothing at all. We can do nothing that is truly effective. And by contrast, Jesus can do all. He is in control. 
All night we saw in the story the, la- the labors of the disciples. They were serving and working hard, laboring to catch fish all night long. And they couldn't catch anything. And then in one moment, they get a catch in their nets that they can't haul up to the boat because Jesus fills it. And Jesus wanted to teach them here that they can do nothing without him. Even fishing, even something they know so well, even something they have skills in that they are able to do well, they cannot do it without Christ. They are dependent on him. And when they work hard in their strength, when they work hard on their own without Christ, they can do nothing. Jesus wants them to see this. And it's the same with the gospel, with serving Christ for us. It's the same with us. It's the same lesson. We need to serve in the Lord's strength. We must seek God in prayer. We must seek for Him to be working. We must rely on His strength. Otherwise, we can do nothing without this, without God working, without relying upon Him in prayer. All that we do is useless. It's a waste. God was teaching me this a little while ago as well, back in Psalm 127. It says in this Psalm, it says at the first few verses, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman Stand guard in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. On our own, our efforts are futile. We can do nothing without Christ. It's only with him that we can be useful. We can work hard on our own, but but it's ineffective. We will burn out, we'll be useless. But God, through God, it can be effective. We can be useful. And we must rely on His strength, particularly in service and in serving Him and in taking out the gospel. Because the work of God is the only thing that can bring about salvation and maturity and revival. So we need to stop doing everything in our strength. We need to stop trying to do it all in our strength. Otherwise, everything that we we think we're doing for the Lord is actually vain and achieves nothing. Well, the second big point that comes from this story, and it really does build on this, is that Jesus provides strength. And so we must rely on him. The first one was that Jesus controls all and we can do nothing without him. And now we're going to see how Jesus provides the strength we need. And so we must rely on him. We need to depend on Jesus. Again and again, this story showed the need to depend on Jesus. As we said, the disciples, they fish all night, they get nothing, but in a few seconds, their nets are filled by Jesus. Relying on Jesus for a few seconds is infinitely more effective than 10 hours of hard labor on their own. Oh, that we would learn this quickly. We need to learn this lesson. We need to stop trusting in self. We so easily run to trusting ourselves. We run to trusting our abilities, what we can do, the knowledge that we may have, our gifts, our talents, We rely on self so much. We rely even on our jobs, maybe what our family might provide for us. We rely on our savings. We rely on what this government might provide for us. But do we rely on God? We need to stop relying on self, but rely on God and not all that we can do. And Jesus has been teaching this again and again in the story. He's been showing how they need to rely on him. He's been showing it as well as he provides bread and fish to the disciples. He's provided an abundant provision for them and he provides strength to them and he serves them. And in this, he's showing them that they need to rely on him. And how he deals physically here with them in this story, how Jesus deals with them in this story physically in providing and serving and caring is the same way that he will deal with them spiritually as they go out to take the gospel out. 
He will provide all that they need to be fishers of men, to spread the gospel, to mature people and disciple them. He will give them the strength that they need. And we need to learn this lesson too. We need to learn the lesson that we must rely on Christ. That's the only way we can be equipped for God's work. That's the only way we can serve Him. God must give us the fuel that is needed to keep the light of the gospel shining and to spread that gospel. He must give us the fuel. He must provide that energy that is needed. If He is not working, it will be useless. And as well, he must be relied on, God must be relied on for someone to even be saved. We know this. We know that we must rely on Jesus to be saved from our sin. The disciples, again and again, they've been shown how they are incapable, they are helpless and weak on their own. And this is just a picture of us in our sin, isn't it? We can do nothing. We cannot save ourselves. We are weak and helpless. As the hymn writer says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We are hopeless on our own. We can do nothing like the disciples to save ourselves. We need Jesus. We need to trust him. And we must trust him because he can abundantly provide what is needed. His death on the cross provides all that we need to be saved and forgiven to be brought back to God who is good. So we need to rely on Christ. You need to rely on Him. You need to give up that reliance you have on all your efforts, those useless efforts, all that you can do. Give up that reliance on those things and cling to Christ. And then finally, the third lesson I want to draw from this passage is that we see Jesus serves His followers so that we can serve him, so that they can serve him. As we said, Jesus came to serve. He came to give his life as a ransom to save. And he goes to prepare a place for us so that we can dwell with God forever. He served the disciples. He washed their feet. He he served them breakfast. And he is here to help us. He wants to help us. He serves us. And he helps us and cares for us as we spread the gospel. We need to realize this so we can be bold in spreading the gospel. Jesus serves in so many ways and cares for us and provides. And so we must serve him. You may be in a season of being unsure of how to serve God. You may be overwhelmed by all that there is to do. But you need to realize that you have Jesus to trust. All authority has been given to him and he is with you to the end of the age and you can trust him. He has a plan. He is in control. He is serving you and he provides the strength we need to serve him. Let this enable you for his service as you work hard in the strength that he can provide. And don't work on your own strength. Don't Do everything relying on your abilities and your gifts and your thoughts and your knowledge. If you do that, you'll be useless. Everything you do will not be effective. You will be like that wick on the lamp that has no fuel in it and you'll light up for a little bit and it'll seem like something good is happening and then you'll burn out soon after, and crumble up into nothing and perish. You must be fueled by God to enable ministry, to enable your service of Him, to enable a life of holiness lived for Him. You must be fueled by God and be strengthened by Him. So rely on God. Pray to Him. Rely on Him through prayer. And rely on the firm foundation of his word. And realize this. Realize that relying on Jesus and having God work in your life, relying on him and his strength for three seconds is infinitely more effective than all your hard work. Infinitely more effective than a whole night of the disciples working hard. So rely on God. Let's pray. 
Father, we pray that you would teach us these things in this passage. Oh, how we need you. We need to rely upon you. God, we can do nothing unless you work, unless you strengthen us. Teach us this. Cause us to pray to you and rely upon you in your word as well as we seek your wisdom. We need you to work amongst us, God. We need you to save. We need you to grow people, to mature, mature them. We need you to bring about missionaries, to raise up missionaries in our church. We need you to raise up disciples and followers of you. We need you to work, God, to bring about revival in this nation. And so we pray, God, that we would rely on you for this work, that we wouldn't rely on our gifts and abilities and our strengths and what we think we can do. But may we trust in you, God. And even now, God, may we rely on you through what we have heard. My words can do nothing. We can do nothing to change our lives, God. You must bring the conviction. You must bring the change in us. And so we pray that you would change us, God. Make us into a people that would be reliant upon you, that would cling to Christ for their strength, knowing that we can do nothing, God, without you. Please grow this in us, God, for your glory. Amen.